Right, hi there everybody. Uh, in today's video, we're going to talk about uh, the variation of melting point going across period 3. We're also going to be speaking about, uh, in the later part, variation of um, the electrical conductivity going across period 3. So let's look at the first uh, part over here where we're going to be talking about melting. Uh, right? Melting is basically a process whereby you actually turn your solid into liquid. And of course, uh, melting therefore involves the process of breaking down the lattice structure of a compound. Now, we have seen the different types of lattice structure already uh, back in chapter 4. We have a few different types of lattice structure there. Back in chapter 4, we spoke about uh, the giant ionic lattice structure. We have the giant metallic structure. We have also giant molecular structure as well as the simple molecular structure. Now, since we're going to be talking about just elements of period 3, right? So, we're going to be speaking about specifically about giant metallic lattice structure as well as uh, giant molecular structure that we see in silicon as well as we're going to be seeing some simple molecular structure over here right so so so, so the first point over here right you need to actually fill up here is that the melting involves the breaking down of the lattice structure of the elements in period three hence the melting point of the element actually indicates the strength of forces holding the particle structure in the crystal lattice now always remember when you are actually turning your solid into liquid, you are needing to break the lattice structure. So you need to actually overcome the lattice forces present between those particles present in the lattice structure. So let's look at the first one here, right? If you look at the, the points that are actually given here, right? The uh, melting point generally increases from sodium to aluminum because uh, all these elements that you're looking at here, sodium to aluminum, they basically have the giant metallic lattice structure. Right, giant metallic lattice structure because they are all metals over here. Right, all right. So the melting point increases from sodium to aluminium simply because that the strength of the metallic bond increases as you go from sodium to aluminium. Now we have talked about this already back in chapter three. What are the factors that actually causes the strength of metallic bond? to actually increase going from sodium to aluminium. And one of the reason being here is that the number of electrons, all right, that can be contributed to the C of the localized electron cloud increases from sodium to aluminium. Remember, each sodium atom can donate one electron to the C of the localized electron cloud. Each uh, magnesium can donate two electrons to the C of the localized electron cloud. Each aluminium can donate three electrons to the C of the localized electron cloud. So the more electrons that can be contributed to the C of the localized electron cloud per atom, the stronger is the metallic bonding. So this is what we are actually seeing here, uh, why the melting point increases from sodium to aluminium. Right? It's because the strength of metallic bonding actually increases going from sodium to aluminium due to the increasing number of electrons that can be contributed to the C of the localized electron cloud per atom. Right, so the, the next thing we're going to be seeing is that you look at silicon here. Silicon over here, if you look at the graph on the very next slide, silicon actually has the highest melting point out of all the elements present in period 3 simply because silicon actually exists as a giant molecular structure, giant covalent structure, macro molecular structure. These are just some, some, some different terms that is actually used uh, for silicon over here. So they have this giant molecular structure over here whereby all the silicon atoms are actually uh, bonded by strong covalent bonds. So in order to break down this particular lattice structure of um, silicon, you need to actually overcome all the strong covalent bonds that are actually present between the silicon atoms in the giant molecular structure of silicon. So the reason why, right? always remember, silicon has the highest melting point is because they have giant molecular structure with strong covalent bond that needs to be overcome in the process of turning your solid silicon to liquid. So silicon, always remember, highest melting point there. Then you look at the next uh, four elements over here. You have phosphorus, you have sulfur, you have chlorine, and you have argon. Now all these elements that you see at the uh, uh, bottom over here, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon, uh, this, this four elements actually has uh, a, a kind of kind of a low melting point over here due to the fact that they have um, existing in the form of simple molecular structure 
right? The lattice forces that is actually present between the phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon are just induced dipole-dipole attraction. Or some actually call it Van der Waals forces, right? So this, this forces of attraction, as you know, it's actually a weak forces of attraction that requires just a little bit of energy for you to overcome them. And that's why you can easily convert your um, solid right, compounds of phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon into liquid very easily because you only need a small amount of energy for you to actually break this uh, induced dipole-dipole attraction that's actually present uh, within the structure of the simple molecular structure of phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. So uh, if you look at the uh, point that I actually mentioned over here, right, low melting point because they, have sim they exist as a simple molecular structure with weak induced dipole-dipole attraction present within the molecule. Now, I'm sure there's some of you who are actually wondering right now, right? If you look at the, um, um, the, 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 the pattern of the melting points of this uh, three compounds, let's talk about phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, first of all. You will notice that sulfur actually has a higher melting point compared to that of phosphorus. And as well with the higher uh, melting point with that of chlorine as well. Now, now, what's the reason that actually causes the sulfur to have a higher melting point compared to phosphorus and chlorine? Now, some of you does not know this, but the uh, phosphorus actually exists as P4, right? Four phosphorus atoms bonded together to form a molecule of P4 rather than just P as what you notice over here. They don't exist as a single atom um, element over here. They exist as a uh, in a molecular form P4. Sulfur, meanwhile, exists as S8, S8, eight atoms bonded together to form the um, element of sulfur. I repeat, S8 again. Now, and then of course, chlorine, we all know that chlorine exists as a diatomic molecule, Cl2. So, P4, S8, Cl2. You actually remember something over there? Remember that uh, all these elements have simple molecular structure. Remember that uh, these elements actually are, you know, bonded together by the induced dipole-dipole attraction uh, within the lattice structure. So in the case of um, sulfur, if you notice, this is basically the illustration over there showing you that uh, sulfur exists as S8. Now, the strength of induced dipole-dipole attraction is affected by the number of electrons present uh, within the molecule. So S8 over here, right, consists the most number of atoms um, that is actually present over there, right, um, compared to phosphorus and so chlorine. But more importantly, what's more important is a sulfur S8 contains uh, more electrons within the molecule of S8 compared to that of phosphorus. Uh, S8, basically the proton number of sulfur is uh, 16. You just multiply by 8. Compared to the phosphorus, proton number is actually 15. You multiply by 4. Just compare the numbers as you can see over here. You will actually notice the difference in the number of electrons present within these two molecules. Obviously, uh, S8 would have more electrons present in the molecule, causing them to have stronger induced dipole-dipole attraction compared to that of P4. And that's why you notice over here on the uh, graph, right? you notice that sulfur actually has a higher melting point compared to phosphorus because sulfur exists as S8. There are more electrons present per molecule compared to that of the P4 whereby they only actually contains uh, um, four atoms that actually bonded to one another. Right? So in this case, the uh, remember, whenever they actually test you on it, always mention that the sulfur actually exists as S8. So therefore, there are more electrons present in the molecule of sulfur compared to that of the phosphorus. More electrons means you have stronger induced dipole-dipole attraction. Stronger induced dipole-dipole attraction means you need more energy to actually overcome uh, these forces of attraction to turn them from solid into liquid. Right? Always remember that. That's uh, a popular question in Excel. So yeah, that, that chlorine over there, you know, it's basically just, uh, yeah, chlorine exists as a diatomic molecule. Uh, that's actually 17 times two electrons over there for chlorine, right? And uh, rightly so, they actually have the uh, least electron compared to that of phosphorus and sulfur. So that's why uh, you look at the trend of the melting point, which is something that you have to be able to sketch in exam. Uh, you need to actually remember to sketch the uh, uh, sodium all the way to aluminum, there's a gradual increase in the melting point here. Silicon has the highest melting point and then dips down to phosphorus, you know, and then sulfur has a little bit of a peak, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, chlorine, it dips down again and then it goes down again for argon. Now, uh, please bear in mind, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon, they actually have low melting point 
right? If you look at the uh, sodium, sodium doesn't actually go too far off, right? Sodium's uh, a melting point is actually around 80 to uh, 90 degrees Celsius, right? So again, what happened here is that sodium, even though they have uh, metallic uh, bonding that is actually present as a lattice forces um, um, for sodium, right? They do have kind of a low melting point as well. So uh, if they ask you what is the uh, melting point of uh, sodium, Right, let it be. You have to classify it as low, medium, or high. It has to fall under the low category. Now, yes, they have metallic bonding, but unfortunately, the metallic bonding here is not as strong as what we are expecting them to be because each sodium only contributes one electron to the sea of the localized electron cloud, and the size of sodium is also um, relatively large. So, therefore, causing the metallic bonding that's formed around sodium is actually you know not as strong as what we expect them to be. So sodium, right? if they ever ask you to classify whether they have low, high, or medium melting point, you have to classify them uh, to be in the same uh, category as that of phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. They do have low melting point. This is actually a part of the exam question. So that's melting point. Um, remember, uh, sketching the uh, graph uh, is actually very important. Make sure you're able to do so. All right, I'm gonna move on uh, quickly to talk about the variation in terms of electrical conductivity. Now, as you can see, obviously the sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, they are all conductors. They're all conductors of electricity. Why are they conductors of electricity over here? It's because that uh, they clearly have the C of the localized electron cloud. Remember, we talked about it just a moment ago, right? So sodium, magnesium, aluminum, they, they, they are having giant metallic lattice structure. Uh, they do have the C of the localized electron cloud that is actually surrounding them. So C of the localized electron cloud is a mobile electron that actually carries charge from one end to the other end. So sodium, magnesium, aluminum, as you look at the graph over here, has an increasing trend of electrical conductivity. Rightly so, because uh, like what I mentioned just now, right? From sodium to aluminum, there's an increasing number of electrons that is actually present in the C of the localized electron cloud. Each sodium atom donates one electron to the C of the localized electron cloud. But each aluminium actually donates three electrons to the C of the localized electron cloud. The more electrons you have in the C of the localized electron cloud, the greater the uh, uh, what do you call this ability of the C of the localized electron cloud to carry charge from one end to the other end. Right? So that's uh, the case of sodium, magnesium, aluminium. Silicon, please remember, it's actually a semiconductor, right? In order for them to conduct electricity, most of the time, you dope it with some other elements. That's pretty common there, right? Silicon, right? So it's actually just a semiconductor in a lot of electrical uh, devices, right? And circuits and so on. Phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine are, however, non-conductors of electricity. What's the reason why? I think you know it very well because they don't have either mobile electrons, they don't have mobile ions as well. In order to conduct electricity, you must have either one of this. And phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine being um, um, non-metal, right? They are basically a simple molecular uh, structures over here. They don't have any of those free mobile ions and free uh, mobile electrons. So therefore, they're not conductors of electricity. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you very much, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you very much. Bye.